August 24th, 1814, would go down as one of the blackest days in American history. It began with a humiliating defeat at Bladensburg, Maryland, and ended with the destruction of the nation's capital. The events of this one day would test the mettle of a young nation and provide some of the most memorable moments in America's so-called Forgotten War. While the British overrun American forces and advance on Washington, just six miles away, one woman remains firmly entrenched in the White House, the First Lady, Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison is my favorite character in American history. And the reason is this woman is not only courageous and heroic, uh, risking her life uh, to save things for posterity. This is a woman who is beloved the, the most beloved woman ever to occupy the White House, admired and respected by the rich, uh, absolutely beloved by the poor. Dolly and James Madison make up one of the oddest couples in Washington. While the president was bookish and introverted, she was the life of the party. She loved to dip snuff, play cards, and scoop ice cream, all while modeling the latest fashions. But. Don't think of her as someone who is superficial. People think of her as someone that they respect. They understand that she has the ability to bring out the best in her husband. She makes the president more approachable. She helps bring factions together within the Republican Party. She's a very astute and very charming first lady. But within hours, the British would be at the doorstep of the house she had transformed into the center of Washington society. She receives word from her husband, who's out rallying troops. Evacuate the White House. As the desperate minutes dwindle, Dolly Madison heads for a national treasure. This is a woman who, at the risk of her life, while the British are advancing on Washington, and the male guards have fled from around the White House, this lady decides to save George Washington's portrait painted by Gilbert Stuart for the single reason that it has to be protected and saved for future generations. Which one of us, male or female today, would risk our lives for a painting? And she did that. I insist on waiting till the large picture of General Washington is taken, so I have ordered the frame to be broken and the painting taken out. It is done. The First Lady is among the last to evacuate the city. She finally boards her carriage, searching for her husband. By 8 p.m., British forces, led by Major General Ross, enter Washington. It was never expected that an army of 4,000 men could march with little or no difficulty, take and have at its mercy the capital of the United States. In retaliation for burning the Canadian Parliament at York the previous April, British troops prepare to set fire to Washington's government buildings. Redcoats, under the command of Vice Admiral Coburn, break into the capital. They stage a mock legislation and vote unanimously to burn the building. One resident watches the fire from her rooftop. No drawing room was ever as brilliantly lit as the whole city that night. As flames burst through the roof of the Capitol, there was a roll of thunder. At about 10.30 p.m., the men move on to another key government target, the White House. In the dining room, they find the table set. Coburn orders wine poured, and in a sarcastic toast to the president, drinks to Jemmy's health. Soldiers rampage through the rooms, grabbing souvenirs, including a ceremonial sword and a pair of rhinestone buckles. Even Major General Ross pockets President Madison's love letters to Dolly. Outside the mansion, the Redcoats pitch their torches through the windows, engulfing the White House in flames.
The destruction of Washington's public buildings, these fires, the glow of which was seen 50 miles away, struck at the hearts of many Americans wherever they were. Every American heart is bursting with shame and indignation at the catastrophe, recalls George Douglas, a militia private. Perhaps no one feels the emotions more deeply than President Madison, who watches the fires from horseback in Virginia. There's no sign of panic. There was intense concern about making sure the government didn't fold up. And he felt, a, of course, a responsibility. At that stage, Madison was thinking, where would he find Dolly? Where would the rest of the government be? How could he reconvene them to show that the government could still function and still exist in an effective form? The next morning, August 25th, the British set the Library of Congress and the Navy Yard afire as storm clouds threatened overhead. But at 2 o'clock that afternoon, two events would transform a burning Washington into a scene beyond comprehension. With little warning, one of the most powerful hurricanes in its history hits Washington. Lightning splits clouds open as gale force winds tear through the city. Out of nowhere comes this uncanny storm, which not only dumps a tremendous torrential downpour, but it rages against this British column. One redcoat recalls the fury of this perfect storm. Our column was completely dispersed, as if it received a total defeat. Some of the men flying for shelter behind walls and buildings, and others falling flat upon the ground to prevent themselves from being carried away. Such was the violence of the wind that two pieces of cannon were fairly lifted from the ground and borne several yards away. What has started out as a blessing is about to become a catastrophic event of epic proportions. As the hurricane wreaks destruction throughout the burning city, a tornado suddenly appears from the sky and shears through the center of the capital. For two hours, the immense storm rages through Washington, dousing most of the flames that have turned the capital into an inferno. We now know a tornado actually touches down like the wrathful hand of God from the Old Testament and inflicts more casualties in the middle of that British column than they even suffered in Bladensburg. When the storm clears out the next day, so do the British. The invasion force returns to Benedict, Maryland, a battered and bewildered unit. Meanwhile, the president and first lady finally reunite at a roadside tavern. They return to Washington on August 27th and view the devastation. In just 24 hours, a capital that had taken 10 years to build had been reduced to a charred wasteland. The White House is now a smoldering, roofless shell. The Madisons realize that they will never live there again. Dolly's depression turns to bitterness, and the president condemns the British as damned rascals.